Now, uh, we are seeing how in the Gospels people would come eagerly after Jesus. They wanted to go with him on his journey. In fact, that's what we saw last time I spoke. People were eagerly following him, and Jesus puts it on his hearers to understand they knew what it meant to live for him, to go on the route that he was taking. He puts it on us. Do you know what's involved here? And uh, this next story in Luke shows an example of uh, what you could say is short-lived enthusiasm to follow Jesus. It presents an example of the danger that the love of wealth has in leading us away from a true commitment to Christ. However, the good news that's proclaimed in this passage is that nobody, nobody is impossible for God's grace. A person who is motivated by greed can turn to Jesus Christ. Anyone can turn to Christ. Now some obviously have harder hearts of resistance than others, but we should never think that anyone is a certain lost cause. See this as we explore this person. What is apparent here and in all the Gospel accounts is that he was an affluent person. He was a wealthy person. He also gives us the impression of a pious uh, Jewish person because he wants to know the secret to Jesus. What must I do, good teacher, to inherit the kingdom of God? What must I do to inherit eternal life? So, in this world of raising children, paying bills, making a living, having a career, making and maintaining uh, relationships, friendships, family... Is there anything more important than knowing the answer to this question? I would say no. For all the important things in this world that we must attend to, what can you do beyond the grave? What control do you have at that time? What will be the outcome after that? So this is a good question. It's a good question. But Jesus says firstly, uh, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I could spend time talking here about the sense of meaning and if there's something deeper to what Jesus is saying in his words here, but I think it would amount to a bit of speculation on my part. So I'll just suggest here what Jesus is probably first and foremost doing. He's warning this young, eager man not to speak about the nature of goodness superficially or haphazardly. In relation to God, none of us compare to him in his righteousness. Goodness is no sort of small, flippant matter. He goes on. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honour your father and mother. You know what God's word says. You know the Ten Commandments that God gave our people, you know. So evidently Jesus knows he's speaking of a pious man who is familiar with God's law, so it's a relevant response by him. But actually... The Bible says everyone, everyone has a sense of God's truth. No doubt when Adam and Eve transgressed in the way that they did, something changed for the worse. Sin and death made its way into our domain and it's, it had, has terrible repercussions, something that would have to be fixed by our Lord and Saviour Jesus himself. Yeah, often we call this the fall. But this does not mean everything about humanity is always and only evil. That we do and think evil is not in dispute, nor that we need a remedy for it. But image bearers have an intuitive sense of right and wrong. Paul actually says in Romans... Uh, chapter 2 from verse 14. For when the nations who not having the law by nature do what the law demands, 
they then are a law to themselves, even though they are without the law. They show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their, their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So we're all born with this intuitive awareness of God's law imprinted upon our hearts. And that's why those around us whom we know, whether Christian or not, are not constantly behaving in a murderous, destructive pattern of behaviour. Okay, it's true that uh, one can do the right things for self-gain and selfishness and all the wrong reasons and it be sinfully motivated, but actually people can still be kind for kindness' sake. And that's beautiful, thank God, because if all humanity had reached its capacity for evil, it would have self-destructed before Jesus even came on the scene. So your unsaved neighbour, whether Macedonian, Albanian or anything else, has the imprint of God's law upon his or her heart. And the image of God remains in this world even after the tragic garden event. And this is why humanity has an imper imperfectly wired desire for justice. But when a pattern of sin is allowed to reign in people's hearts, it cloaks our God-given conscience. And when this happens, we excuse and justify <coughs> sinful behaviour. And that's when injustice happens in our world. And that's when humanity becomes what you could say as lawless. And just as we see kindness in this world, we see this, right? Don't we? we see lawlessness. And actually, the defining characteristic of the time before the end is described in various places as being a time of lawlessness. And you read through history and you wonder how on earth one group of humans could do what they do, did to another group. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the image of God is still present in this world on the unsaved. That innate that innate dignity we have as image bearers is why we, unlike the animal kingdom, actually have the privilege to face God in judgment. So the human problem is not that we only do evil. The human problem lies in the fact we do not measure up to God's perfect standard, which is where Jesus is in part taking his discussion with this man. Before you turn to Christ, you are under God's law. And if you're under God's law and you're not in perfectly uh, uh, aligned with his standard, you're under condemnation. That's the state that you live in. So what we need is to be set free from being under the law. If you're under law and you don't measure, measure up, you're under condemnation. And uh, when there's no law to condemn you, we're free to um, obey it by, by love. The fulfilment of, of God's law is through love. The confident young man interrupts. So you, so you notice how Jesus lists just about all the Ten Commandments that concern how we relate to our neighbour. You know, um, Honour your mother and father, don't covet, etc. And actually, did they didn't get around to saying that. Uh, um, don't murder, don't commit adultery. And so the confident, the confident young man interrupts Jesus, maybe before he got around to mentioning the last commandment, prohibiting covetousness. All these things I have kept since I was a boy. Now I figure this man was at least in his 20s, but doesn't this sort of read like a classic teenager? I mean, I believe he's, he is saying it in a polite way and he's sincere, but it has that air of confidence that this is all very easy. Though it's a similar response you'll see in, say, those evangelism videos where an evangelist walks um, through the Ten Commandments with a stranger and, and they're like, but, but, you know, I'm a good person, I don't steal or kill people. And to an extent it's true, but by heavenly standards, and, and, and people don't see their need for Christ because they think they're good. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. 
Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And, and this is the crux this is the crutch of the problem. One thing, one thing. Interestingly, Jesus doesn't dispute the piety of the man in his diligence to keep the commandments. Instead, he issues a challenge. Sell everything you have and follow me. Focused, focus on heavenly treasure. Now, the theme of the importance of generosity has come up quite a bit recently as we've looked at Luke's Gospel. One thing I'll say, though, while it's very much in keeping with Jesus' teaching that our heart's disposition ought to be that we would give up everything for Christ, this sort of direct instruction of Jesus is an exception to the rule. Certainly, as I say, this is consistent with Jesus' teaching. So in the Sermon on the Mount, what did Jesus say to his hearers? Don't worry about what clothes you'll wear and the like. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Don't store up for financial wealth but heavenly riches. But this sort of direct challenge is not usual. To sell everything you have and give to the poor. Keep in mind in this period of history there, were the, there, were not real, there was not really a large stable middle class. There were the have, haves and the have-nots, and overwhelmingly most people belong to the latter category. Most of Jesus' audiences were not in a position to even think of doing something like this. They were too busy trying to ensure that they had daily bread and were working overtime to ensure the physical elements of the, of the earth didn't uh, bring them undone. But this man could... But could he? Or should I say, would he? And that's the problem here. When he heard this, verse 23, he became very sad because he was wealthy. The, the problem was not, first and foremost, the wealth that he had. And this is not some sort of socialist teaching on the part of Jesus. Jesus. As if the redistribution of wealth will just fix everything and earn brownie points of God. Actually, you remember what Jesus said to his disciples when the woman poured expensive perfume on him. He said, the poor you will always have among you. There's always time to be generous. So he, he, Jesus was a realist, as I said previously. No, the problem... First and foremost for this man was that he loved wealth more than God and others in effect. Again, what was the one commandment Jesus did not get around to mentioning? Do not covet. Elsewhere, Jesus says you cannot have two masters. Either you'll love the one or you'll hate the other. The desire for the one is diametrically opposed to the other. There is a reason why Jesus started his discussion reminding the man not to talk about goodness flippantly. Pleasing God is not a matter of just ticking off boxes in order to ensure that you enter the pearly gates as the jokes often go. Now you see how there is actually a lot of similarity between this man and in this same chapter that we're looking at the attitude of the Pharisee in the parable who declares his commitment to God's law, unlike that tax collector over there. I do all these things, says the Pharisee. All these things I have done, says the young ruler. That many people are, that many people are fairly good on, on a surface level. Again, it, it, this is not in dispute. Many people are good on a surface level. And I'm sure this man, generally speaking, was an upright person. But God looks deeper than outward actions, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And Jesus identified something lacking in him. His heart was short of God's standard of goodness. 
who walks away justified in the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. It's the one, you could say, whose lifestyle up to that point, on a surface level, overtly violated God's commands, especially concerning stealing, but also covetousness. The difference then is, is, is a heart of humility before God and a recognition of his wrong. And, that, and that, that's what the other clearly lacked. As Jesus says, you know, I didn't come for the healthy but the sick. I, I, and the, I didn't come for the lost sheep. I, 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 no, I came for the lost sheep, not the, not the, not the righteous ones. And unfortunately, at this point in time, while in the presence of Jesus, this man was not willing to concede the premise of Jesus' argument. He wanted his wealth more than a he wanted his wealth more than a commitment to him. This is why Paul says the love of money is the root of all evil. It vies for our loyalty. And. Later on, Paul goes on to say in this, that, that same passage, is if many who have wandered after it have actually departed from the faith. That's how dangerous the love of wealth is. And much of the history of tyranny can largely be put at the knees of the worship of wealth. Of course, money is something that we all need to get by, but there are, even in this lifetime, there are more important things in life. Relationships are more important, are they not? Mm -hmm. And what matters most of all is eternal life. If you love money, you want it for yourself, and so you hoard it for yourself, nullifying the thought of generosity, and you think more and more of it, and you think you need more and more of it. And I think this is what Dayan was speaking about last week. Uh, this young man wants the best of both worlds. He wants to be able to love his wealth and he wants to gain eternal life. So his quite sincere enthusiasm was short-lived when he realised following Jesus means giving up his whole life for Jesus. So... Is that the tragic end of the story? Was all hope lost for this man? Now, we don't really know what the outcome was of this man before Christ. But Jesus expounds further upon the problem to the man. Although in uh, Matthew's Gospel, the man walks away sad, and then Jesus in instructs these next words I'm about to read to his disciples. So verse 24, so he says... According to Luke, to the man, how hard is it for you, for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, uh, people who like to sow will relate to what Jesus is saying here when you look at a, a, a needle and how small the eye of a needle is. It's tiny. A camel is too large and fat to ever go through the eye of a needle. Actually, that's, that's an absurd statement on my part and I feel stupid even saying it. It will never happen, ever. But according to Jesus, it is easier for this to happen than the rich to enter the kingdom. So this means wealth and the love of it must be a powerful force, a very powerful force. We probably don't appreciate appreciate just what a powerful force that it is. Actually, I remember listening to a man do a talk for a men's event, and he said, "Yeah, I've had all I've had men confess all manner of sin to me, struggles and all sorts, and you wouldn't believe the sorts of things they confessed to me. But never once, never once did one say to me, I have a struggle with greed.' Mm. An interesting point, and is is it something that we actually recognise? Now, the disciples are shocked by Jesus' words. They're like, well, well, who can be saved then? Now, you should realise how they saw things then. They, they, they didn't think like the 60s, if you will. 
Um, the rich were seen to be the generous ones who gave to the poor. More importantly, the rich ones uh, were often the ones that you were blessed by God because in Deuteronomy there was blessings associated with those who were obedient to God's law. Now, while greed has always been a problem and it's dealt with in the Bible, generally speaking, the way people saw things was the rich were not seen as the bad guys. I do think of a book like Amos where the denunciations against the rich, powerful rulers and all the injustice, but again, um, a lot of the common folk didn't necessarily think of the rich as the bad guys. And they're thinking, well, if that's them, what about us? How can we be saved? What about us? And herein lies the good news of the passage. Nobody, nobody is too hard for God. And God's loving grace is available for everyone. What does Jesus say? What is impossible with man is possible with God. Now, so if there's something we learn about in this passage, it's the danger of greed and the love of wealth. But God can do the impossible. Nobody's too far gone. Even the greedy and prideful person is never to be assumed too far gone. If we backtrack into the Old Testament, we can look at some amazing occasions in the Bible of God having mercy and grace on some uh, really wicked people. Uh, have you heard of the story of Manasseh? Not, not the tribe, the person. The, the evil king of Judah. Everything about him was bad. He was actually the son of the good king Hezekiah who reformed the evil practices of the southern kingdom. But Manasseh went out of his way to do things his way, committing even child sacrifice of his own. Idolatry at the highest level and witchcraft. And there's all these graphic details about the sort of idolatry he was committing. He defied the Lord to the best of his ability, and yet after being humbled in captivity, he humbled himself before God. And you know what the Bible says? God was moved by his prayer of entreaty. God was moved by his humility. God was moved by this man. Can you believe it? Or again, the Ninevites and its king all turned to God at the preaching of Jonah. So for maybe, I'm not sure, perhaps half a generation, these people worship the true God. So much so that Jonah spits the dummy. It would be easy to rip into Jonah, and I'm not saying his behaviour was right, but to be fair, the Assyrians were horrible. They used to do all sorts of crazy stuff, like they would uh, um, line up uh, uh, skulls across the road just so you know that they'd been here and you better not cross their path. Still, what is impossible with humans is possible with God. Then there's Nebuchadnezzar, remembered as the pagan king who cruelly exiled the people of Judah. The megalomaniac who had people forcibly honour a statue of gold and, and whatnot with the death penalty for non-compliance. And one day he was humbled in a rather bizarre way, he seems to have some sort of mental breakdown of some sort, but the net result was he was declaring the Lord to be the true God. What is impossible with humans is possible with God. What about closer to our story in Luke after the event? Do we have an example of the rich people turning to Christ? Well, we have Acts 4.36. Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the feet of the apostles. Here is a man giving up his wealth for the kingdom. And now, now here in our passage, 
Jesus assures Peter after he declared that he and the disciples had given up all to follow him, as they're freaking out about what Jesus is saying, whatever you have given up for the kingdom will be repaid in this life and in the next with all sorts of spiritual and heavenly blessings. That's Jesus' promise. And the great early missionary Barnabas gave up his wealth for the sake of the kingdom. I haven't even yet mentioned zealous Paul, so as he was once called. The Pharisee hostile to the early Christians, who he saw as sectarians and dangerous. And you see him in his letter to recount, you see him recounting his letter to the Philippians, how loyal he was to the law and how he had the same kind of confidence in his obedience to it. In fact, he says, no one compared to me. There was none like me. But then he goes on to say, those things I counted as a gain, now I count them as a loss for the sake of knowing Christ. You might know someone who came to Christ who you thought would never turn to Jesus. He, she is too hostile to the message you, you were thinking. And this, this person is just too hard-hearted. And to your amazement, you witness their salvation. And maybe some of you would say that about yourselves. In Luke's gospel, it's the tax collectors, the thieves, the prostitutes and the like who are turning to Jesus, the holy ones. Um, at, well, sarcastically said, the holy ones are the ones at risk of being cut off in Luke's gospel. But sometimes even the self-righteous turn to Christ. And Paul is the best example I can think of. But also that's why Luke mentions uh, in Acts and some Pharisees believed in the Lord Jesus. Yes, even those ones, so often the enemies of Jesus in his earthly lifetime, and then soon later um, uh, his followers they also became followers of Jesus. So God can do amazing miracles in the hearts of sinners. Everybody can turn to Christ. Nobody is too far gone before their death and the second coming. But there must be a turning. That is the only hope for eternal life, is to turn to Christ. And it's found in following after him. But I, I, I hope this message stirs up hope for you. Because it gives us all hope for our friends and our loved ones. Amen? Amen. You might have a neighbour and you think, well, this person would never turn. They're in a, a Muslim family and the pressure is just too strong. Well, the Holy Spirit is stronger and sometimes because of this, the person is willing to give it up all for Jesus. So take heart. God is incredibly merciful and he loves to forgive. He loves to delight in people. He loves to transform the lives of not only individuals but, in, but whole families. With God, all things are possible. Amen.